This is Daily Blast Live. We're talking about what you're talking about. Real, honest, entertaining, live. DBL starts right now. Three, two. Welcome to Daily Blast Live. It's Monday, January 20th. I'm here with Brandon London, Lindsey Granger, Al Jackson, and I'm Erica Cobb. We've got a very special show planned for you today to honor Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. On this national holiday, we celebrate a man whose bold leadership and bright words sparked the civil rights movement, shining a light on black Americans and our fight for equality and representation, a struggle that continues to this day. I wanted to ask each of you, what does this day mean to you? Because I don't know if y'all feel in this power right now, <laughs> but I'm feeling a little Maya on Martin's day. <laughs> we are the hope and the dream of the slave right now. Yeah. Um, this is very powerful. What does it mean to you? Uh, I mean, for me, it, it's everything. You know, I, I think about, I'm a little bit older than most of you guys. I'll just be nice and say oh, that. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, you know, I, I, you know, Erica, we talk about it all the time on the show that, this was not that long ago. I think the, what we lose, because when we see footage of Dr. King, it's in black and white for the most part, you forget that he was a young man, a, a very young guy. And these things were not that long ago. My grandfather went to stores where, uh, you know, there, there was not only segregated water fountains, but there, you know, they, they just wouldn't sell things to him. And it was just yeah. a thing. There were places where you couldn't stop. You know, my, my family's from Jackson, Mississippi, so it was just like that movie yeah. Green Book means something yeah. to me. Uh, my family, I heard those stories 20 years ago. So for us to be sitting here, different walks of life, different points of view, but all, the, every, every adventure we led led us right to this point means something, and I just wish Dr. King had been alive to see it, but yeah. I believe he does anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I thought a lot... Go ahead. go ahead, go ahead. Well, I thought a lot about this, and one of my favorite people is a professor named Melissa Harris Perry, and she said um, so eloquently that I think we need to think of Dr. King as a human and not divine so that his legacy becomes more accessible mm. and useful to all of us. Yes. I think that every day we can wake up and do something that is in light of his legacy and the fact that he was empathetic for people. And when you go through life with that kind of idea in your head that you're going to be open-minded and fight for what the better of the future, your kids and everybody to come, I think we can all do that every single day. And so the platform and being here and being able to share our stories with the world is my part and I want to continue to do way more to try to embody his legacy. Yeah, and it's a day to celebrate black excellence. I mean, every day is, but like a day like this to see a, a all African-American panel is because of the sacrifices that he, he went through. And when I speak black excellence on his end, I'm not even talking about the uh, uh, I have a dream speech. I'm talking about him being so smart, so brilliant. He skipped the ninth and 11th grade and attended Morehouse uh, College at 15 years old. So that's what I'm talking about when it's uh, black excellence and celebrating uh, Dr. Martin Eric, what does it mean Jr. for you? It means so much because I've been told my entire career and it's been 20 years that um, a panel like this wouldn't exist on uh, mainstream media, mm. on broadcast television. So the idea that we're all sitting here today talking about a man who did so much for the civil rights movement um, really cleared a way for us to sit here, um, especially 20 years later. I'm looking at it like, psh, you were very, very wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. And how many doors are we opening right now? And that's a very powerful thing. Well, as part of our special coverage today, we're also taking a look back at moments on DBL that really speak to our continued fight. And one of the things that I saw on the show but never got a chance to ask about was this moment from you, Lindsay, when you were talking about Atatiana Jefferson, a black woman who was shot in her own home by a police officer. Watch. I hate that the police are showing that there was a gun in the home and releasing those pictures because there's nothing nefarious or illegal about owning a gun, especially in Texas. And so this, Absolutely. to me, just looks like, um, at the very least, an indictment, if not a murder charge. Like, watching this young girl, she's a grad student, an eight-year-old... I know. The, 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 I know. And I, I'm, I'm, I do know. we have any tissues up here? That, and I know how you feel right now because honestly, I'm all, I'm 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 angered right now. And I know Al, you're our voice of reason. And so I'm not going to come off. I, I'm not going to come off as that guy right now. I promise you that. But what we're seeing right now is we're watching the the, the path go towards a Bible and a hug. And, and, and her dad said I mean he doesn't that? want to hug. Her dad said, don't hug me. Yeah, the father no, has no. come out and spoken and said, this is absolutely you, senseless. You know what I mean by Bible and the hug? Because that's what Amber Geiger got the other day when, when she was sentenced. She got the Bible and the hug because you're seeing unedited 
heavily unedited body cam video. You're seeing them release saying that he thought that she was a perceived threat, even though he did not knock on the door or and announce, and, and, and that announce she's a himself. Lindsay, so, what's, I just have to ask what's going through your mind right now. I just want to be honest because obviously you're feeling things. Just how are you feeling right now? I'm just scared that you cannot be in your own home anymore. So it's different if your body is perceived as a threat as an African-American existing here. But the fact that two people in the last month or two months were killed in their home in Texas is scary. Like, I, I just don't, like, we already have a problem with the police. And so to know that you can't even call them without getting killed, this is a welfare check, yeah. this man called. Yeah. Just because our door was open, they didn't even bother knocking on the door. They went around back. Imagine if you hear somebody in your backyard walking around. You know, Lindsay, I just want to speak to that because you were very candid about the fact that you had an incident. And was that something that you were feeling in that moment that you could be in her position? Yeah, I think it was an uptick of events. So I worked in news for a long time. So we saw Trayvon and then we saw Tamir Rice who got killed within two seconds of having, you know, a fake rifle in his hand by Cleveland police. And then we see Mike Brown and all these instances. And then it happened to me in Phoenix. You know, I got locked out of my apartment. I called the cops. I come to my own front door and the police had a gun in my face. And that's right after Sandra Bland. So I thought my life can be in danger at all times. And then to watch with a Tatiana Jefferson, I just saw somebody who was in her own home for the second time in in the Dallas Fort Worth area. This happened where someone was killed in their own home and I was terrified. You know, there's no place that you're a black body can be now. You're essentially telling us by saying that we can get killed in our own homes. You know, I just want to touch on this briefly because a Tatiana Jefferson story um, resonated with far more people. And I think the reason why is because everyone could put themselves in that position. The fact that the police officer never saw her and just shot made more people more empathetic. And I just thought, well, if you can be empathetic with the idea of not being seen, then you should have empathy for just another human being. You know, and just listen to uh, Lindsay talk, it just hit me, you know, I always do a little quick math between myself who's, uh, I, I was pulled over by the highway patrol and had a cop's gun put in my face uh, without, within an inch or two. It's like 50% of people on this panel have had the barrel of a police gun pointed at their face. And I mean, that's, that's just math. And I know what we do whenever, whenever we have a situation or an incident, we immediately, well, he was running towards him. And he kind of, he was flailing his arms or she was, it, these are people that are locked out of their homes. This is a kid going home for college. Uh, I don't think people really understand that we can have a conversation about police conduct without it turning into police bashing. Discussion. It's just yeah. a discussion about yeah. human lives. It's duality of thought. Well, there was another tearful moment that I wanted to highlight. It was in the days after the Thousand Oaks shooting, and Al had an important message. Take a look. That guttural noise that came yeah. out of him is the yeah. noise that comes out of a human being when they're in so much pain that their body won't let them experience anymore. And I just hope that. Every viewer that watches this show or sees this clip or whatever re takes people to task. When your uncle says something derogatory or out of line at a barbecue and you let it go, when your dad says something homophobic in the living room and you let it go, when your aunt tells you she's about to write a mean tweet and you laugh about it and you just say, oh, that's just Aunt Sam, you are also responsible for spreading hate. When you hear somebody say something, you call them out right then. I don't, it's, it's not about party lines, it's not about red and blue. There has, been, there has been a lack of humanity in this country for so long that I feel like some of the generations coming up are showing us how to live again. The kids from Parkland gave me hope for this world. I am so embarrassed about my generation and what we allowed to happen, what we continue to allow to happen. You know, out to put context to this, um, we had just learned in real time that a father had found out that his son that he was looking for from the shooting the night before um, was in fact one of the victims and you were reacting to that. Do you think that people are changing their minds? Have you, have you seen any difference since then? I've seen, I've seen a difference in that I, I believe finally people are getting fed up. You don't hear thoughts and prayers as much anymore. Uh, we do see a little bit more action, but we don't really demand it. When people uh, ask for more action on any kind of, I don't, you can't even say gun control because people turn the channel. Any kind of just step towards any kind of rationale involving guns and gun violence, it's met with so much pushback still. 
I wonder when we'll see a difference. Again, I think a lot of these things will work themselves out once we get money out of politics. Uh, but I hope that we have at least put in place some systems where if Lindsay's posting weird things on her Facebook, if Al is sending threatening messages over Twitter, I think more people are more proactive about saying, let's get these people some help. So I will say that we as a community of human beings has done better in that regard. I, well, that's our hope, too. We need our laws to help us now. Exactly. Well, next, take a look at this moment from Brandon, calling out the media for the way so many black men are portrayed. Watch. I'm waiting for eyewitness testimony. I am waiting for cell phone footage because we've heard this before. We've heard law enforcement lie. And I'm not trying to sit up here and be like, oh, the angry black guy, let's point fingers at, at, at the cops and you stuff like that. You come from a family of but, law enforcement. But I come from a family of law enforcement, Sam. And it's, it's just, we only do stories because there it's black men and women that are being shot and killed yeah. with a gun or without a gun. We are only getting those stories. And then what do we see when, when we get it? We get, the th we get the media portraying us to be thugs or portraying or saying, oh, someone had weed on them or something like that. But then when the New Zealand person shoots 29 Christians, he's labeled in Western media as how did this angel turn out to be a terrorist? Well said. And just side note, it was Muslims, Muslims not, not Christians. Christians. Yeah, and it kind of goes back to what I was saying. It goes back to what you were saying uh, for the Tatiana Jefferson. What was the first thing that was released? She had a gun in the house. It meant absolutely nothing. And Al, we talked the other day about how we can go some places to where we know that we're aware that we're the only uh, black person there. And if we have a hoodie on, we take the hoodie off immediately. So you're always thinking of your image as a black person in this society. And that just, that clip right there is, is the reason why. It's just about how we get portrayed in the media from yeah, time I mean, to time. I, I think as a, as a person of color, your mind is never clear. Sometimes like when I'm out and I'll just see like, uh, like a group of, of people that aren't black walking around, I just wonder like what their day has been like. Like what is it like for them to go into stores and like to go places and not always think, I'm always thinking, okay, I'm walking to the store, but there's two 16-year-old uh, white girls in front of me, so let me, let me slow down and let them go a little further. Should I cross the street? Yeah. Uh, when I go into the store, all right, let them know I have a little bit of money. I'll carry this around over my, over my, my forearm so they'll know I'm gonna buy this jacket and not try, and it's constantly, it's mm -hmm. like, I have a master's degree. Yeah. And I'm yeah. thinking these yeah. things all the time. And so I, you know, I, I, I think there's always going to be this, this jealousy, just being able to just like walk around and just like have your mind clear, like not think, okay, there's a cop over there, or you know, just, uh, or just getting pulled over, and not, not thinking this is gonna be the last time I'm gonna see my kids. Right. So I, I, I hope one day, you know, Avery and Elijah and Baby Four will have that clarity in mind that I never will. Well. It, I think Amen that's the to biggest that. thing that we try to explain to people is our experience in this world is constantly being apologizing for just doing normal things. We're not able to just move freely through this. You talk to your kids or we'll talk to your kids about how they should behave if a police officer pulls them over. I was spoken to about how to dress at certain times, how to talk to people in certain ways. And so I think that we cannot just be free and act like kids, which is a bigger part of the problem because Absolutely. a lot of the kids are the people that were taken away from us due to gun violence from police. Well, we're having these conversations. People are listening, and I do believe that we are making changes in this world, at least for your children. I definitely that. Coming up on DBL, one of my favorite moments ever on the show, my document of my natural hair journey. Y'all trying and to make me cry never today. guess who it was that inspired it all. Plus, find out how each of us are honoring Martin Luther King Jr. on this national holiday. As we go to break, we leave you with these inspiring words from a true American hero. What's up guys? It is my honor to join you guys and I'm thankful that you guys joined us on this wonderful day. Celebrate Dr. King's legacy, his memory, and uh, how he continues to propel and his ideologies continue to propel themselves well on into 2020. People, look, look at this last year we just had uh, with people fighting for equal rights in terms of uh, equal pay for, for women, uh, obviously for gender rights, uh, for the right to tell the world who you love. Uh, Dr. King is at the genesis of all of that. And so 
as we sit today with the day off, I understand that uh, a lot of you guys, we all work hard. Uh, we're enjoying kind of catching up with the family, kind of lounging around the house. But please, uh, just if you do it as a favor for me or, 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 or whomever, take a few minutes and just look at his life. Look at the legacy that he left and talk to somebody that you love about how you can continue his ideologies and how you can push those into the future. We are getting better. We are progressing. It's slow, but it's steady, but it's definitely happening. So let's make sure that we, the DBL Nation, continue to do our due diligence and make sure that Dr. King will never be forgotten, which he absolutely will not. Thank you, Dr. King, and thank you, DBL Nation. Appreciate you guys. Welcome back to DBL. In honor of Black History Month, we want to take a look back on a very important moment in my life, the journey that led me to rocking my natural hair as a black woman in media, a natural hair representation that many of you are still fighting for in your respective fields. So growing up, I loved watching television, but there were so few representations of me and what I looked like. Hair can be so personal, especially in the black community. And we're told, you know, you need to straighten your hair. You need your hair to look a certain way to be presentable. And what I found the most freeing thing in the past few years about my hair is that I feel presentable and respectable no matter what my hair looks like. So I talk a lot about hair and my husband hears it all. And one day we were talking about the possibility of having children and he asked me, well, Erica, if we had a little girl and your hair is covered, are you going to tell her that her hair is beautiful, but you cover yours? How will you explain that to her? And that was the first time that I had ever even considered that I would want my child to at least know that mommy loves herself and loves herself organically and authentically to who I am. When my mother was diagnosed with cancer and underwent chemotherapy and lost her hair, I think that was the first time that I really thought like, wow, like she is not her hair. And it made me think of hair as more of an accessory because I saw my mother kind of become more of who she truly was. Um, completely uncovered. So there was a moment on Daily Blast Live where we were talking about Viola Davis. I got tired of always celebrating movies that didn't have me in it. I don't mean me, Viola. I mean me as a black woman. Stop taming us. And that stuck with me so much because I remember watching her on How to Get Away with Murder when she took her wig off. And I was like, wow, like it was the most powerful thing to see that transformation. But what she was really saying was that this is naturally who I am and this is who black women are. And so ultimately, I want little black girls who are trying to figure out who they are in this world to understand that they don't have to wear their hair in a certain way to be respected and considered professional. So in an age where everyone is touting that representation matters, I want to be a part of the change that I want to see in media today. I've never felt more free in my entire life. Uh, coming up, how a conversation I had with former First Lady Michelle Obama inspired me to embrace my natural hair on live TV. And my hair journey continues. That's when we come back. Luther King okay. Jr. Uh, represents to me persistence, he represents to me fairness, and he represents uh, justice. He has the famous words, separate is never equal. And I feel as though being in the position that I am, that the torch has been passed to me, has been passed to an Al Jackson, uh, Erica Cobb, or Lindsey Granger, to keep, keep the movement going, you know, keep the fight going. So, um, 
It's one of those days where you sit back and you think, hey, I've got this great, great job, I've got this great life, but it's not over. I still have to pass the torch and uh, send the elevator up for young black men and women out there as well. Welcome back to DBL. Before the break, we showed you the journey I took to reveal my natural hair on air. Hashtag on air hair. I will never forget the first time I rocked the look on live TV. Watch this emancipating moment. Talk to us about your hair journey. So almost three years ago, I decided to cut off all my hair. Um, it's called the Big Chop. Um, a lot of black women are familiar with that. For me, it was bigger than that because it was a part of my comeback journey. It was kind of my aesthetic um, look or a measurement of how far I had come. So when I cut off all my hair, it was right after my divorce, <laughs> unemployment, bankruptcy, and I was restarting my life. And a part of that was cutting out the old and starting with the new. So this has been almost three years. Wow. And are you going to continue to speak on this? Yes, absolutely. Amen. Absolutely. Stay tuned. So it's really crazy because last week a Colorado uh, House bill is aiming to um, end discrimination of natural hair in the workplace. So that's almost a year has gone by and so many strides, the Crown Act in um, both California and New York. So we're really at the beginning of this major movement. Something that you said really stuck with me talking about being respected for your hairstyle and you being able to wear any hairstyle and be respected. Talk about how that emancipated you. You use that term to describe freeing your hair. Because people have to understand where these standards come from. Someone made the decision that this is how professional hair looks. We've never questioned who that person was right. and what gave them the right to set the standard to say that what organically comes out of my head isn't professional. Mm. So I think we need to have that conversation, continue that conversation, and that bill better pass. We'll be right back. <laughs> We're celebrating MLK Day today, and I'm really happy that you guys are joining us. We're talking about his legacy and the way he's impacted us all, and I think we all know that he's making us all be our best versions of ourselves. My favorite thing that I think is that he embraced empathy, and it's important for all of us to walk forward and fill his shoes by just embracing and understanding other cultures that are different from our own. It's a very heavy subject because of the times that we're in, everybody thinks they're so different, but we have more in common than we do that separates us. So I just think everybody should spend the day really enjoying each other, embracing each other, and remember that his legacy is not this huge thing that is unhuman like that we can't fulfill. If you come together and do your best every day, that's what he embodied and embraced. And I think you can leave your legacy just the same. This is Daily Blast Live. We're talking about what you're talking about. Real, honest, entertaining, live. DBL starts right now. Three, two, Welcome to Daily Blast Live. It's Monday, January 20th. I'm here with Lindsay, Brandon, Al, and I'm Erica. We've got a very special show for you today, commemorating the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Dr. King was hugely influential in the American Civil Rights Movement and was a major advocate of nonviolent activism in the struggle to end racial discrimination. Now, before we get started, I'd like to take a minute to ask each of you how you think society has changed since Dr. King was tragically assassinated in 1968. I think we made huge strides. You know, we you go from slavery to MLK to Obama being president, you can obviously see the strides, but you would think, I, I heard someone talking about it earlier, that you would hope that our grandparents did the work so we're not experiencing some of the things that we are. But as much as we're highlighting those experiences and seeing bad things happen, I think we have progressed a lot more than we have moved backwards. And so I'm just happy to see that I think this new generation is opening their mind to a different level and way more diverse than we've ever seen and open-minded to one another. And so I think that that hatred based on skin color will start to dissipate as we continue to move forward and to touch on that open-mindedness I you know back in the day when a black person would speak out they'd just tell them to shut up or they would just tell them oh what are you complaining about boy That's nowadays we see polite. yeah yeah exactly <laughs> we're on daytime TV so I don't want to get in trouble but nowadays you're seeing our, our counterparts our colleagues our Jeff Schroeder's Sam Shockers Tory Shulman's sitting there feeling for us understanding what we're saying and, and really um, being 
very aware of our experiences and being an ally at the same time. So I think that that's a great thing that we've had over the time that's that's changing. You know, to your point, Brandon, I mean, to be very clear, the reason why I am so outspoken, I think a lot of us are so outspoken, is I feel that responsibility. Your quote earlier about Dr. King being seen as a person, not as some like fictional, like, you know, God deity, that's very important because it puts the responsibility back on us sitting in these seats today. I say what I need to say from my level of understanding because my mother would have been fired and my grandmother might have been lynched. Yep. So I'm the first person who's able to really speak to the truth of what our experiences are. So I think that we all need to look at our situations like we are humans just like the people who open the doors for us. They had to make some brave decisions. We are in this position to make some brave decisions because these are the decisions that our grandchildren are going to be talking about about how these doors were opened. Right, and that, that's why I appreciate this platform so much, Erica, because we can have days like we have today, and we can also have days where we're just goofy. <laughs> where we're like, Brandon, yeah. that was the silliest thing I've ever heard. What are you talking about? And <laughs> yeah. just have fun, and that's I think people look at us, and they see us as, as 360 individuals. Yeah. And once you can understand and empathize and actually like somebody, you can understand their struggle, and I think that's what this show provides. It's not just us, uh, some uh, you know, avatar on Twitter saying, respect all black people. People. women should be paid equally they should but that doesn't mean anything to them for them these people have sat with us for an hour a day five days a week you better and because of that they get to know us as people and they understand that where we're coming from is from a place of love mm -hmm. It's important. I mean, you have to have empathy or you have to understand that you're person to person in order to be empathetic about anyone's plight. That's right. Well, in honor of Dr. King, we are taking a look back at moments on our show, highlighting his legacy and reflecting the struggles of African Americans. One moment I was very passionate about was when Gabrielle Union gave job advice to young black girls. Take a look. Yeah, um, another quote that a lot of people are talking about in social media says, uh, she said, don't be the angry Negro that does the bidding of the status quo because you're afraid. Um, this is super powerful because um, I, or don't be the happy Negro that does the bidding of the um, status quo. Um, it's a very powerful statement because a lot of people find themselves in the situation. I myself have been in this situation. It's always been enough for me just to be there. It's really at this point, and granted I'm coming from a more privileged position, it's not worth it to me to be there and people see me and not be heard. People are ill prepared for this conversation because we're not used to seeing, especially black women in privileged positions to be, to be able to stand in their power and their truth. I don't know how I was blessed with this position, but I was. Because you're incredibly and, talented. Yeah. Well, that, I just, that's why. Thank you, Al, and same for you. I just feel, sorry, <laughs> I just feel like I wake up some mornings and I don't know why I was pit to be here. Like, I don't. I don't know if I'm the right person to do this, but I'm here and I'm not gonna squander this opportunity. And thank God, I finally have had the opportunity after, like I've been doing this for 20 years. Right. And now I have a voice and people tell me every day that I can't be afraid and I have to speak out. I didn't go to school some academy to learn how to be like a leader of the black girl community, but here I am and I'm not gonna squander this opportunity. So if I sound like noise to you, you're sick of hearing me, well, you're just gonna have to continue to be sick of it because that's what it is and I'm here and as long as I'm here, if I stop doing it, then the next girl can come and do it because it needs to be done. Problem. Yeah. What was going through your mind? I, I know that that's been your whole platform. You always want to make space for the person coming behind you. So what was going through your mind when you realized that that moment was turning into you sharing your personal story and opening up? Well, I, I don't think, here's the thing that people don't understand at home is that we don't plan for these things to happen. It just happens because when you're being really honest about who you are and what your experiences are, um, that's a very vulnerable position. And if you're if you're able and open enough to share that with your colleagues and share that with the world, then that's really how connections are built. And I think that there are a lot of shared experiences for people who are of color, for people who aren't. And when you show your heart, like that was true, I don't know why, but it's not for me to question why. It's just for me to do the work. I just always remember, and I'll always remember this, when we were on that rooftop that time, we were having dinner and you know we prayed and you were kind of going through some things at the time and me and Al kind of told you 
you can't stop. Like you can't stop this that. journey. We all have our different platforms. We all have our different ways that we're gonna be able to send the elevator up. But your elevator and the things that come out of your mouth not only inspire all of us, but it's inspiring generations. There's a reason why every time my mother comes here, she's, where's Erica, where's Erica? She can't wait to go talk to Erica because you're a queen, you are a black queen and you have to keep going because there are people out there that have to hear your message. Thanks a lot, Brandon. No, <laughs> no, I no. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, I, people. We, we, I just want to be happy. Yeah. And I got to a point where I didn't know if this was what was making me happy, and I thought um, I have to be my most authentic self and use that gift in order to try to help somebody else and maybe that's where I'll find happiness. And I do feel like I am happier. Um, but yeah, at that point, I didn't know if this was my path. And I think a lot of things have happened when you ask for signs that um, tell you that you're on the right path. So I do feel yeah. that and I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. So we all go through our awkward phases growing up and it's a part of life. However, when a journalist chose to mock a young black girl for her looks, I couldn't keep silent. Because you guys know like how I feel about talking about children in general. I think they're off the table. But when you have writers who have this job to write about what's going on, and then I think it's pathetic that you're attacking a child, especially about her features that she can't control. Okay, so my hair was like blue ivies when I was younger. My nose was like blue ivies when I was younger. And constantly since that little girl was born, they're saying, oh my gosh, she doesn't look like North, Kim Kardashian's daughter, because her hair, her hair was not as curly, her nose was not as slim. And so they're not understanding that that kind of idea and that kind of creation of what beauty is in America and across the world is what makes black women uncomfortable as they grow up and so we have to normalize that people look different and that's okay and it's really frustrating that this little girl's gonna grow up with all these attacks thinking that the way she looks and the way her hair is curly or the way her face is made up because of her parents is not okay wow. and I think that the, the journalists should do more than apologize they should be fired because they shouldn't be journalists if they want to call themselves that and condescend a young girl you think they should be fired I absolutely do uh, because this has happened time and time again it's not the first time with these look particular to, with journalists. these particular no with several journalists that's what I mean talking about these two kids comparing blue ivy to Northwest and saying that Blue Ivy is basically ugly because she looks like her father. Yeah, I think that their statements, especially coming from a black woman, is deep rooted in some kind of issues in the black community, first of all, for her. And for a white man to say that, that's deep rooted yes. in some slavery issues yes. and yes. the fact that we are segregated yes. based off our looks. Yep. So I think yep. there's some bigger problems here. So, so yes, that part of it, I definitely there's agree. There's just a with much you. more dangerous context to what they did. I yeah. think you're absolutely yeah. right, Lindsay. Yeah. And I mean, we all know Blue Ivy is an eight-year-old beautiful little girl, and so I don't get understand where adults get off condescending a child. I never understand that. And so we know that this is deep-rooted in colorism issues, racism issues, the fact that our features are less accepted than our white counterparts. And I want to really change that and bash that anytime that happens, whether you're a critic like one writer was, or a journalist, or anybody who wants to just do better in this world. You can especially not attack a child, but don't attack a child based on her looks mm -hmm. of a young black kid that's constantly been the center of attacks for our whole lives. I agree. Thank you, Lindsay. And coming up on DBL, we take a look back at a moment I will never forget. We teamed up with some of our friends to give one deserving veteran the surprise of a lifetime. And we continue to honor Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. As we go to break, we leave you with these inspiring words from a true American hero. Martin Luther King Jr. Day mean to me? Um, it means dreams realized, really. Um, obviously, his speech, famous speech, I Have a Dream, um, meant that he dared to dream but also put action behind it. And because of those actions, I can sit on this panel and talk to the world coming from my level of understanding um, and really make connections in order to advance not only the rights of people of color, of African Americans, but also the rights and, and uplift voices of other groups that feel marginalized. I think that's a very shared experience. And the idea of having a dream and the realization of said dream in order to forward humanity um, is something that we all can make an effort to do each and every day and I'm just very blessed to be in a position right here to do that with so many of you. 
Welcome back to DBL. Every day, millions of Americans struggle to find reliable transportation. That's why last year, DBL teamed up with Midas, Project Spark, and 1-800-CHARITY-CARS to get a deserving veteran back on the road. Before we show you the surprise, let's watch Erica Cobb sit down with Brian to hear his emotional story. Brian! Oh my goodness. <laughs> so nice to meet Such you. A pleasure. Such a pleasure. The to pleasure meet you is as well. all mine. Have a seat. What made you enlist? And tell me a little bit about your time in the military. The main reason why I enlisted was access to the GI Bill, which was the opportunity to go to college without student loans. You know, my parents weren't exactly in a financial position to send me off to college. I'm definitely glad I made the leap. I've got to go to nine countries, meet people I would never meet otherwise, and see all kinds of, of great things. So you also became a dad. I did. And you have a teenage son. Parenthood changes everything. It's all about the child, 110%. He's been my life changer. He's my motivation. That's why I get up every day, you know, is Brennan needs it, dad's on it, you know, that type of thing. You're going at it alone as a single dad. Um, how has that shaped you? It makes you extremely, extremely resilient to trials and tribulations that you go through. It makes me plan. You know, I have to think ahead. I have got to always be a step ahead. Something that you didn't necessarily plan for is being diagnosed with lymph node cancer three years ago. Right. Take me through that process um, when you were diagnosed. Oh, wow. Well, it was about four months after I had just got full custody of Brennan, so I was kind of like, you know, in, in celebration mode, if you will, of, of finally having him in my life full time. But to get that diagnosis, it was tough. That was one of the first times in my life I've ever felt out of control. Right now, I, I believe I'm getting some positive response from it. Um, I typically get scans about every three months and that's after they run one of the regimens of medication, again, one day at a time. So what effect has chemo had on you? I'm not as sharp as I used to be. The side effects are, you know, five times worse than I think the, the cancer itself is, you know, the, the neuropathy and the ringing in the ears. And I've gone through the transition in the past few months with starting to lose teeth from radiation and chemo decay in that. And, Sometimes just waking up and not knowing what's going on. So I want to talk a little bit about your comeback story because generally when it rains, it pours. This time last year, I was kind of in a situation with between missing work and not being able to make ends meet. Uh, I basically lost my apartment. It put me in, in a position basically where I was on the street. I basically set up arrangements for Brendan to stay with his best friend for a few months. Just have him somewhere stable, because that was my biggest thing, is if I can keep him stable, I can get out and take care of business and get us back to where we need to be. But I was living in my car. I was, you know, more or less moonlighting at the VA hospital to, you know, kind of take a bird bath. And I became extremely dependent on my car. My, my vehicle was everything, you know. I lived in that. Uh, that was my life, you know. A lot of psychological and mental challenge with that. But I'm a self-proclaimed pretty tough cookie, so through it all I fight. That's all I know is fight. Tell me about the car accident. What happened that day? So basically I leave work and, you know, headed down the road and someone pulls out in front of me. Told it was my car. That was one of those distraught moments. I'm in a position where those necessary things that I need to truly be a, I won't say a good parent, but make a meaningful move, getting myself to work, getting him to school, going to field trips, whatever, to, to fulfill my, my role as a parent, that having a vehicle and having my own home again is everything. When we come back, the surprise Brian didn't see coming. Welcome back to DBL. Before the break, we introduced you to Brian, an Air Force veteran who refuses to give up. We took Brian to a Midas outside of Atlanta where friends lined up to be a part of a DBL surprise. Brian, your service to our country and your positive attitude are absolutely inspiring. We know that things can be troublesome for veterans. Um, it can be a very challenging situation and we want to do something very special for you at the beginning of this holiday season. So on behalf of Midas, 1-800-CHARITY-CARS and Daily Blast Live, 
We want to present this Volvo that has been repaired for you. Project Spark is a national initiative created by Midas and 1-800 Charity Cars, really dedicated to getting veterans, families, and first responders back on the road. We really want to see him get back on his feet. For what he's done for our country, we just want to make sure that we're doing something for him so he doesn't have to worry about that issue anymore. Thanks, Thank guys. Thank you for your service. Appreciate you guys. I there so you appreciate you Enjoy guys. Enjoy that, man. man. That is awesome. That is cool. Oh, wow. Let me in. <laughs> let, let me you in. in. <laughs> I do know the unlock <laughs> features. Oh, wow, that's nice. Oh, you got the leather seats. I got the leather seats. <laughs> <laughs> you deserve it. You well, absolutely deserve thank you. it. Thank you. I so appreciate it. So, My son is going to be like floored. Oh, and wow. this was actually a complete surprise to him. He thought I was just coming up for an interview. He doesn't know I'm coming home with a car. Oh, my <laughs> so, gosh. So I definitely can't wait to see his yeah. face. This is yeah. like blessings of plenty. Without a car in Atlanta, it's just it's, it's something that's extremely hard to deal with. Mm -hmm. You know, you got the ride share services now, but it, it's tough. It's mm -hmm. tough. And my car was totaled a few months ago, and I'm still yeah. dealing with that. Um, but this right here just puts me in a completely different positive place. You know, I'm also dealing with, with a little bit of health issues too. I'm going through chemo treatment for lymph node cancer. So one day at a time. You know? So you've been going to your chemo appointments, working, taking care of your 17 year old son, all while having to rely on public transportation. Yes, ma'am. For, for a couple of months I have. I do whatever it takes to get up, get my son to school, get him in the best environment for him to succeed, and take care of my day. Yeah. Know? So he's my drive, he's my motivation, and we're gonna do it a little nicer. And I've been in situations where I have depended on public transportation, and I've been in situations where I've had my own vehicle, and generally we appreciate those things based on our experiences right. but with your story I appreciated those things based on your experience and now you're in a situation where you can appreciate where you've been and where you are as well as well as where I'm going what are you f most looking forward to in terms of having because this is a space this is your space <laughs> pulling out my map let's go you know. You're going to pull out a map, Brian. We're going to ride out. We're going to do an old school way you... with the marker and the highlighter. No, you're not. Get our fix on Route 66. <laughs> I did not see that one coming. <laughs> Can somebody get Brian a map? He said he needs a map. That's amazing, Brian. You deserve it. We'll be right back. Welcome back to DBL. We have a few words before we go. Brandon? Yeah, I just think about when people always say, what would the world be like if Martin Luther King Jr. were still here today? And I think about the sit-ins that he helped orchestrate back in the 1960s that gained national attention with no social media. So just think about the awareness and attention he would have had today uh, had, had he been around. And continuing his legacy, I know I, I'm the newest one at the table, and when I joined, I'm like, there's three people of color on this show. I'm probably out, but really... You know, I didn't think that when I came here, Tegna opened its mind and ideas to people of color having different backgrounds and experiences and different things to bring to the table. So we are his living legacy. Yeah, Absolutely. That's right. And I'll keep it real simple. Have some fun with your kids today when you talk yes. to them about MLK. It doesn't have to be all the negative stuff. He was a yeah. guy. He was a dad. He's yeah. a fun guy. So make sure to reinforce that and go over it with your kids like I did today. We just want to thank Tegna, our parent company, our bosses, our producers, yes. our ally co-hosts, and all of you, but mostly Dr. King. Happy birthday.